glad to be here. This is great. I'm excited to be able to, to uh, well, recap this thing. One of those things, so much happened during that one week that it took me quite a while to even begin to process it in my mind. Sometimes things happen so fast that uh, it just takes a while to, to get it all back in order again. Uh, so this happened uh, June of this year during the week of solstice. Uh, it was actually three years in the making. Uh, I wanted to get up there or get wherever the APGA, American Public Garden Association, uh, was holding their conference and demonstrate or, or have a lecture with them at the very least and, and get members of that organization using words like crevice gardening and North American Rock Garden Society, things like that. I notice we're advancing here. Let's Okay. All right. Let me go back here. Um, so it all worked out. Obviously, we had we had one year it just wasn't it wasn't in the cards. The next year and the year after that, it was it was COVID. Uh, but finally, uh, the APGA was going to hold their annual conference in person again, and it just so happened uh, that it was going to be in Portland. And so, uh, tons of Zoom meetings correspondence back and forth, grant applications, um, talking with, uh, you know, Sean Hogan, Paul Spriggs, Kent and Seth, uh, Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting, a plan came together. Um, how many people in here have been uh, to Cistus Nursery or Rancho Cistus? Or we've got a few hands. So all of you already know this, but for everybody else, did you know that Sean Hogan has a lot of plants? Oh, he does. Uh, let's see here. That's the back button. Let's go forward. How do we advance this thing? No, I don't believe so. There's one. Oh, might be a little slow. There. Oh, I see. It's it's slow. Okay. I'm right, gonna go back then. All the way back. Okay. We're gonna wait two seconds. And we push forward once. Okay. Okay. All right. So here's uh, here's John Hogan's place. Uh, this is one of his greenhouses. Uh, it's about thirty miles, thirty minutes rather, northwest Portland, uh, on five acres of Savi Island, which is a little flat. Uh, kind of like a sedimentary island um, off of the Willamette and Columbia rivers. Um, so, and, and again, as people who have already been there know, it's a very dense, diverse garden, very dense, diverse uh, nursery, tons of plants. Uh, let's put that in perspective. So Rancho Cistus has 20,000 taxa. Let's compare that to Juniper Level Botanic Gardens. We have 30,000 taxa. However, Rancho Cistus has all of those plants on five acres, and JLBG has ours on 28. So 4,000 taxa per acre to uh, 1,000 taxa plus per acre. So it's amazing how many different things are packed in there. So uh, a plant lover like myself can pretty quickly get lost in the greenhouses and in the garden. So... We're going to start by just focusing mainly on the crevice garden. Uh, again, I mentioned a lot of Zoom meetings, a lot of planning, years leading up to the, the opportunity for this to happen. Uh, Sean, of course, volunteering a space in that extremely densely populated botanic garden that he has just for a crevice garden. And so he cut some trees down. There's dead, dead elms, dead maples there. Uh, Not far after that, this spring, he had a bunch of perlite and peat base brought in. It was like perlite rejects. It, it was a very interesting material. So it's like perlite, but firmer, harder. It just, it wasn't the same, but it works great for crevices. Uh, Sean also sourced some free boulders that were actually native to the island. And I think those might've been all of the native boulders on the <laughs> island. Um, but there they are. That's also Sean's foot. Um, very beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous rock. Some of them up to about 3,000 pounds. Uh, 
mossy, uh, gorgeous stone. And so what we needed to do in, as part of our planning is uh, find the crevice stones, the, the more flat rock. Since we've got some free rock, we can use crevices around them in them, mix them up, uh, blend them. Uh, so we, we found some beautiful uh, stone called Montana Moss Wall Rock that was for sale. And so when we went to make our purchase in April, it was sold out uh, for the season. So that was no longer an option. And so <laughs> the rock that we ended up being able to get um, was Kamas Basalt A-Split. Kamas is actually a, a place just uh, east of Portland, uh, but very, very nice stone in and of itself. Um, but that's uh, what we were gonna have to stack our crevices with. Uh, the flight out there, here to Salt Lake City, uh, that is snow on mountains in June, which as a Midwestern boy myself, originally I get excited about that. So I've drawn arrows to all of the snow on those, which I studied and was very excited about. Uh, another cool thing and a good omen, if there is such a thing in the Salt Lake City airport, they had crevices, look at that. They had crevices right above the food court. Like I'm hungry. So that was very exciting. I really like to see that. So I arrived uh, at Sean's place at Rancho Sistus. We walk around. I'm, I'm excited by uh, all the different plants, Arctostaphylos being one of the primary ones that I can't generally grow here. Um, but we looked at the site. And um, on the site, we had dozens of cubic yards of crevice media and two dump truck loads of Savvy Island boulders that were staged on the site. Uh, unfortunately, they were staged on top of the stage and uh, in the approximate shape that we had loosely discussed in our prior Zoom meetings. Uh, so in order to stack the crevice garden, all of the soil and stone would have to be moved and then moved back again. And we didn't really have room to do that. So it's like, kind of like a Rubik's cube where I don't even have the ability to peel a sticker off to solve the thing. And so that was going to make it fun. Uh, of course, the next challenge is the stone itself. We had planned to blend it all together. One of my favorite rock gardening moves is to take different kinds of stone, different shapes, and work them together. Um, however, um, you know, we had 20,000 pounds of native Savvy Island boulders, and they didn't look anything like the basalt. We're talking sedimentary versus igneous, weathered versus mossy and sharp, freshly quarried versus warm and blunt. The colors are different. Ones were more spherical, others were very flat. So there was no way to really blend these two diametrically opposed stones. And uh, waxing poetic, they simply had nothing to say to each other. <laughs> but any design problem can be solved uh, first with coffee, uh, a lot of coffee that morning. Uh, but graph paper, although that's, yeah, I guess it's graph paper, I don't remember, but uh, graph paper, colored pencils, and Sean and I sat down at the, the breakfast table and uh, we talked it out. We came up with a plan. How are we gonna use this stone? Um, we've got uh, about 30,000 pounds of stone to stack and we need to make it work together. So we uh, did some strategizing and uh, uh, so, you know, instead of trying to make them all get along, let's celebrate the stone's differences. Let's, let's celebrate how they're not anything alike. Let's create a scenario in which they would have crossed paths at some point, even if just in passing. Maybe a wave of, uh, a wave of tumbling, traveling boulders sweeping over exposed uh, uplifted strata. It's like, you know, based on a true geological story, based on a true geological story anyway. The next step, of course, was to um, flag it out. Uh, blue flags were for the boulders, the yellow flags were for the basalt. And so that we have some kind of a physical walkthrough guideline system that we could begin to stack to. It is challenging to put those flags in place when you have to walk through the boulders. You don't have any clear line of sight, so it's elevationally obstructed by the, by the boulders. But 
So that took some time to, to lay all the flags out. But once they were in place, uh, once they were in place, we we're ready to go. Uh, problem is I can't lift a lot of those. Uh, so every store needs a hero and meet Mr. Beats. Uh, he's one of uh, Sean Hogan's neighbors, lives just down the street. He's about four miles down the, down the road. But if you know that island, that's, that's a neighbor. Um, and he's got a, he's got a small backhoe. And uh, he, he all along was planning to help with the project. Uh, but he was, uh, he was definitely a blessing to have. Uh, we had one day, I had one day, we had one day to stack as many boulders as possible um, so that when Kenton arrived and a little bit later Paul arrived, they would have the space that they need and uh, the site being prepped so that they could begin stacking the basalt. So my, my goal, my mission was to stack as many of these boulders as possible. And again, because there's no room to stage them, they, they have to be almost stacked in order of appearance. So it was not possible to move the boulders out of the, out of the picture, select the right one, and then bring them back in. They almost had to be stacked in the order of appearance. So Mr. Beats brought a small backhoe into an even tinier space, and uh, he, he did a great job, uh, very carefully, very slowly, maneuvering the machine, making several point turns. Um, and we used straps, we lifted the boulders up, we were able to spin them in air and uh, uh, put them back down decisively, confidently. So there's another picture. Things are coming together. Uh, they went. Boulders go together pretty fast. If you can, if you can, you know, if they, they they work well together. Those those round boulders stack well, and we're using the the perlite uh, peat mix fill in the crevices. It's coming together. You can see it following the flags. Uh, anyone who's heard my talks or read anything that I write, I always talk about edges being paramount to a good uh, garden design. Uh, but I couldn't have done this project without Mr. Beats's help. And, and not just because of his machine, his machine operation, but his, his positive energy. He was just there. He was so excited to learn with us. He's not a plant person and he's not a gardener, but he's just a good person. And he absolutely uh, wanted to help and learn and jump in anywhere he could. He went and bought us Subway a few times, which was delicious. And so, like I said, every, every story needs a hero, and I think, I think Mr. Beats filled that role. So by the time Kenton and Paul arrived, uh, the future crevice garden had a backbone and space enough to set the first basalt crossing. And on the third day, there were crevices. And you can see it beginning to kind of cross there. Uh, so I love it when a plan comes together. And then, so just, you know, again, the plan, and I'll go back one slide, crossing, just like we planned. And so before we knew it, Sean walks out with flat carts full of plants, which is not a big surprise um, to have them staged there right away, even though the crevices weren't even built yet. Um, He had actually started a lot of these plants from seed uh, the winter before, so he was happy to get them out of the greenhouse. But we had a couple flat carts of plants just sitting there staring at us, kind of like, um, kind of like uh, new homeowners watching their custom home be built. They're just kind of watching us and judging us from, from afar. The uh, efficiency and ease uh, with which Kenton and Paul stacked stone was inspirational. And working alongside two people so in tune with stone and with each other uh, is, is truly a great, great privilege. And I was surprised, I, I didn't expect it, but Kenton, both Kenton and Paul told me that they appreciated that the site prep and the design constraints and the scheduling of the project um, had already been more or less taken care of because we're all used to kind of doing our own projects and being responsible for those sorts of things, but all they had to do was show up 
and enjoy the ambience, enjoy the garden, and have fun stacking stone. And, you know, again, for me, you know, normally I'm the one having to stack all the stone. Uh, but here I knew that this project, the, especially the, the crevice part of it, it was in the very best hands possible. They literally wrote the book on this. But it is because of moments like these that I have devoted so much to heralding the reciprocity of rock gardening. Uh, bringing stones together in the garden brings people together in much the same way. So here are a couple more pictures just of the construction. Uh, it's coming together, watching people who know what they're doing do what they do. Uh, you can see the crossing basalt, the boulders, mixing a few spare boulders in with some of these basalt ridges. Nice blurry picture there. Enjoy. Um, Kenton and Paul and Sean, on one of the days I was, prevent, I was presenting uh, at the APG about trilliums on my own, this was something separate, but they went to a local quarry and they picked up some even flatter stone. And so we all got to spend some time splitting uh, thin stone to fill the crevices a little tighter. Again, so many great learning experiences, learning from the best and uh, just being there with the banter. More shots of it. Jeremy, how yeah. about pointing out a few given stones and say how much they weigh? Hmm, okay. Let's see if I can track down one of the big ones here. That I think we got one that was pretty big. Some of the ones in this section right here, those are the largest. And although it's difficult to see, some of them like this one was well, this was about a ton. This one here was about 3,000 pounds, which is about the maximum size for the stones that we had. Most of them were in that two to 700 pound range. And the ah, yeah, the vertical, the Kamas basalt, those are mostly in that um, 50 to 100 pound range. They were surprisingly heavy. Uh, I'm, I'm used to working with the kind of like a sandstone around here, uh, but that is, that is very heavy stuff. It, it's um, extremely hard, extremely dense and heavy. I've, just, I've never worked with anything like that, but Kent and Paul have. They were just thrown in a place. They could, you could blindfold them. I think they could have done it just as well. Uh, so we had big stones. Again, that's why that backhoe and uh, Mr. Beats was, was instrumental in making this happen. Mr. Beats was also able to help bring the pallets right over to the site. So we could pull the stone right down off of the pallet and pretty much have it fall into place. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Let's see. So that said, let's talk about the outreach objectives of the Portland project. Uh, with most of the stones set uh, and a sample of Sean's infinite plant palette at hand, uh, we were ready to show and tell. So during the week, uh, several hundred people, and I mean several hundred, people witnessed the construction of a crevice garden in a hyperbotanical setting and uh, listen to us talk about uh, things we're passionate about. Here's a busload of uh, people from the American Public Garden Association Conference. Um, they were all there. I mean, we've got horticultural professionals. Uh, you've got blue collar and white collar horticulturists, but they had other choices with bus tours that day and they, they chose to come out and see the crevices. Uh, the Willamette Valley chapter of NARGS also was present uh, for most of an afternoon. Uh, they all enjoyed walking around with Kenton and Paul and I and Sean, just talking shop, talking about gardening and, uh, you know, mainly plant people. So whereas the APGA crowd is public horticulture, but not necessarily plant people, here you have private horticulture and very much plant people. 
Also, um, something that Sean is spearheading uh, is uh, he's, he's spearheading the Portland Botanic Gardens. They don't exist yet, but they will. Uh, he's raised several million dollars. He's got two giant plots of land, one giant plot and one even gianter plot of land that have been set aside for this amazing, exciting project. So this whole time, you know, he's, he's been involved with working with plant people just as much as he has with politicians. Uh, people who can make decisions, can their signature matters on things that allow other things to get done. So on the evening of solstice, uh, he had a giant soiree. Several hundred people came by, many of which were very interested in the crevice garden. And so Kenton and Paul and I were talking about the crevice garden to these folks. I don't have many pictures of that, but again, just, it was amazing. People from all over the country, gardeners, politicians, just people who want to be involved in this sort of thing were there. Uh, and of course, one back, maybe. There we go. And of course, Kent and Paul and I were, uh, uh, we, we were talking with as many people as we could about what it is that, that we do. And they had an opportunity. The books, of course, were flying off the shelf as they have everywhere they've been so far. A huge part of the Portland venture uh, was our presentation at the American Public Garden Association, uh, their annual conference. Everything you've heard so far in the presentation was planned around this moment. Uh, the opportunity to stand with Kenton and Paul and promote crevice gardening uh, to public horticulture's decision makers. Uh, the conference registrants summed up the majority of public horticultural leadership. Uh, and actually, over a billion dollars a year in horticultural decisions are made by the people in that room. That's with a B. There's a lot of money in, in horticulture uh, especially publicly. I mean, Longwood Gardens right now has a at least $150 million project that they're involved in. And a lot of these gardens have some big seven, eight, and nine figure projects going. And so even if they're not all plant people, some are, uh, even if they're not necessarily interested in, in uh, botany, uh, they're, they're interested in getting people in the gates. Uh, they're interested in these big projects. And so the real goal here is to get those people saying things like crevice gardens and to get, get images of crevice gardens in front of them so that they remember it and can consider it for their gardens. And so here we are. Um, the three of us presented our, our lecture in front of about 70 people. The room was not that large, but it was very full. And again, the, the people in that room had three other simultaneous presentations that they had the choice of going to, and they, they chose crevice garden. So Paul, uh, his part, and each of us, we did 20 minute lectures uh, all in the span of one hour. So we each did 20 minutes. Uh, Paul's specialty was the history and people of crevice gardens. Kenton got up there and he talked about um, the possibilities of crevice gardens. And, uh, and uh, he celebrated the, the benefits of crevice gardens. He actually talked about um, not just plants, but the animals that can inhabit crevice gardens, which is, that's something that's rather new to me. So that was, that was a lot of, I mean, all three of us, I think we, we really pulled it off well. Um, Oops, i go back one again. Come on. There we go. And of course, we all three mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, the new book. Um, so I, I really think the crowd was blown away. Uh, the three of us delivered our messages with the same energy and flow as if we were all talking about one really great day, but from three different perspectives. It just came naturally. We talked because we couldn't help but talk about it.
You can feel a great presentation when it's echoed by everyone else in the audience. While Kenton was, uh, while Kenton was doing his presentation, and of course, we all know some of his sketches, there was one person, uh, she was sitting on the floor to our left with her back against the wall, scribbling notes just frantically as fast as she could. Uh, and so while I was, you know, I was sitting down listening to Kenton talk and I noticed her and I got a closer look at what she was drawing or writing and it was actually, she was sketching Kenton's sketch. And so she was actually drawing this as Kenton was talking about it in his presentation. I just, I almost laughed when I, when I saw that, uh, but I found that absolutely fascinating and encouraging that um, not just our words, but, but the kinds of things that, that uh, you know, Kenton has drawn and, and what Paul says, the things that he's researched and experienced since the 90s, it really was having an impact. It was sinking in with people. So quickly, uh, the last day of the excursion, last day of the, the week, uh, Sean guided us uh, up to Mount Hood, around Mount Hood. I guess uh, I can't come to a rock garden meeting and talk about something. I, I can't skip the fact that we went to a mountain. Uh, so this was an amazing day, uh, extremely fast paced. Again, I guess the whole week was. Uh, so I just wanted to show you some pictures real quick of that day as we went around Mount Hood. Um, different views of the mountain as we more or less went around it. Um, more views. Uh, depending on where you were, we uh, later in the day, it's not going yet. One more time. Okay, all at once. Going back. Depending on where you were on the mountain, you could see other mountains. I guess that's the Cascade Range. Let's see if it helps to get a little closer to it. Okay, there we go. So we were at a, obviously a closed for the summer ski resort. And from where we were standing, we were able to see Mount Rainier and Mount Adams. It's pretty cool. At least I think that's what those are. Yeah. Could you advance one, please? Uh, driving along the road, a giant power line cut. Um, but in all of that sunlight, uh, you had uh, uh, penstemon and uh, a bunch of different wildflowers that have no chance here that uh, didn't advance one, please. Uh, trillium were up there, some cool orchid, which it was uh, uh, epi not epiphytic, it was... Um, yeah. Parasitic. yeah, parasitic. Thank you. Yeah, that's the word. It just blew us away. And um, Lilium up there, Castilea. Is that Xerophyllum? Is that the? Okay, that was yeah, bear grass. It was everywhere. Just tens of thousands of those. Absolutely. You know, you couldn't you couldn't imagine a better wildflower. You can only see it and be inspired by it. Advance one, please. I like boulders, so oh, back one, please. Back, 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 okay. I like boulders, and to see this boulder field in front of us, I'm, and it was, I guess it was about a 300-year-old boulder field. It's something, some, I don't know if it was an eruption or what happened about 300 years prior, and it shook things up pretty good around there. But these boulders were you know, up to house size, but some I could pick up and stack. But just to see them all out before me, I'd never seen anything like that. Beautifully weathered, and I'm just kind of drooling. And oh yeah, there's plants up there too. Oh man, so many rocks. Oh geez, what can I do with all those? I just want to put them on pallets and take them with me. Advance one, please. Uh, we ended the day, uh, kind of followed the Columbia River along, got real dry, not as mountainous, but uh, saw some incredible apiaceous things, uh, you know, just in addition to the beautiful rocks and the water and uh, an amazing place. Advance one, please. There we go. Okay. So, uh, I my goal professionally in my life is to bring uh, to bring the best of horticulture 
uh, which in here we can all agree involves rocks, uh, to as many people as possible. Um, but for the Portland event to happen, 10 people in six different states and provinces were directly involved in the planning, funding, permitting, and execution of the project. And that doesn't include the people who jumped in and helped. It, those are actually people who were core to the project happening at all. So it was a, I can only stack so many rocks, but it was, it, it's truly humbling to be a part of a team um, like this one. Uh, let's see here. Advance one, please. Uh, so in closing, I want to say thank you to the NARGS community and specifically in regards to the Norman Singer Endowment Fund, and here's why. I can personally attest to these three things below here. In 2016, I think it was, um, the Norman Singer Grant funded the material and Kent and Seth's mentorship for the Juniper Level Botanic Crevice Garden. Uh, that wasn't gonna happen uh, with, without that. In 2020, of course, Kenton and Paul uh, received the grant to help fund their book, uh, which I think it just, it really, it puts crevice gardening now in the fast lane to becoming mainstream. And of course this year, which, which we've been discussing, it funded the construction of Portland's first public crevice garden and promotion of rock gardening um, and NARGS to a national audience. Uh, advance one, please. Maybe. There we go, okay. So these well-placed dollars are having a real impact uh, outside the NARGS community. Um, so I just learned yesterday that Duke Gardens has broken ground on a prominently placed crevice garden. That's right, uh, it is adjacent to the terraces, which is that's their flagship garden. Uh, it's going in. It's happening. You heard it here. Uh, you heard it here first, folks. Um, so, of course, I, I wanted to know a little bit more. So I specifically asked my source in Duke um, uh, about the breaking news. I asked if this installation is directly inspired by the JLBG Crevice Garden and guided by Paul and Kenton's book and the APGA lecture. Not a leading question or anything. Uh, but the answer was absolutely yes. Duke Gardens crevice installation, it wouldn't have happened without the North American Rock Garden Society's Norman Singer Endowment Fund, which made all of those things possible, which has now inspired a garden that definitely does not need the extra funding uh, to build a crevice garden in the way that they do. Advance, please. Uh, so what else can I say? Uh, thank you, NARGS community, uh, for making horticulture a better place. So Amelia asked about the round boulders. Were they, and let me, tell me if I'm wrong, were they stacked first and then backfilled later? Or? I wanna know how you got the soil in there ah. in the cracks. Okay. Many of the boulders that we put in were two and three levels high and some higher. And so in order to properly backfill and avoid too much, you know, big air void pockets, which don't help us at all, um, we backfilled as we went. So we put in a few. And when I'm stacking boulders, I try to avoid doing the base layer and then the layer above that. I want to go all the way up, all the way down, come over here a little bit, skip over here, come back. That way it doesn't look like I'm just dropping in layers like this. That's not how nature works. When it comes to boulder stacking, they moved to get there. They tumbled in place and they, something about the human brain fights that. So I gotta make it look as random as possible. In doing so, as we went along, we backfilled. So we, we had all of that media that was in the way. We moved it over here and now we're gonna shovel it back in. And so we packed it in there as we went. Mm -hmm. Is it coarse? It is, it is lightweight. Um, again, kind of like a, a perlite material uh, with peat. There wasn't really any soil in it, except when my shovel finally got down deep enough to hit the original grade, uh, which was rare. 
so it was very lightweight, which was fortuitous for the fact that we had to move it all and then move it back again, and that being by hand. Um, I would say it was fairly fine, ultra well drained, but um, similar texture as a coarse sand, but much friendlier and lighter, lighter weight. Mm -hmm. It is my understanding that there was a perlite facility or factory nearby, and it was the rejects of it that, that Sean was able to get. Um, I don't know where else it's manufactured. Um, I know that you can you could probably buy perlite in bulk, but I don't know where. I would consider perlite the substitution. I like permatil. I like permatil. Yeah. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. And whereas it's not available out there, it is here, I think. Sean was, is very fortunate that he has a source uh, of per, uh, perlite out there. So it, it was mixed okay. Yeah, it was, it was not perfectly mixed. So some areas are a little heavier on perlite, some areas are more heavy on peat. Um, but having shoveling it one direction and then the other enough times eventually, um, it, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yes, I got please. a few questions online. Okay. Um, Nancy Sutton says, I'm blown away in this presentation, novice and perhaps a naive question, but can you retrofit, so to speak, a small crevice garden to an existing garden, i.e. take small section of the slope and develop it to be a crevice garden? Absolutely. Um, on a larger scale, but one that is easily translated into a smaller one, at Juniper Level Botanic Gardens, that 400 foot long crevice garden acts in great deal as a retaining wall. And that is an existing garden and the crevice garden was retrofitted into it. And so absolutely on any scale, if it's a 400 foot long section of garden that we wanna change into a crevice garden or 10 feet, uh, it's, it's all, to me it's low hanging fruit. It's, it's, uh, it's it's always a good time to do that. Not is it possible, but when can we start? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I just wanted, you might want to talk about my former driveway pullout that was converted. Uh, indeed. So at Cindy's, in Cindy's garden, by the way, does your garden have a name? No, I don't name gardens, I'm sorry. Hmm. <laughs> well, keep that in mind, uh, Nargs. Let's, let's give Cindy's garden a name. <laughs> um, she, Cindy had a, 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 like an extra parking spot that was retained by wood, kind of wood boards, a couple of six by sixes in the corner, allowed for a nine or 10 foot wide by 10 or 15 foot uh, pull in that cut into a hillside. Uh, when we built this crevice garden, and what's that been now, 2018? I think it was been a while. Yeah. Um, when we built that, we, I, I left most of the wood in place. I left a lot of that infrastructure that was retaining the hillside in place because as the wood rots away, that's not a problem. Uh, we stacked uh, boulders up to and in excess of 3,000 pounds. Uh, all along there, crevices, uh, three different quarries of stone went into the project. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was literally inserted into an existing garden um, and, and overlapping existing infrastructure that retained a hillside. And uh, it's still standing. Yes, uh, it, you, you, could, you could potentially convince someone that uh, Cindy built her home around this hillside, that it was there, we didn't want to bulldoze it, so we just built around it. Uh, yes, Blake. Uh, Nancy's asking, well, two parts. Is perlite similar to screenings we have, or can you mix screenings and permatil? Are we talking like gravel screenings? I assume. Sort of yeah, it's it's a it's a textural and, and a it's like soil infrastructure. What this is allowing, whether it be perlite or screenings or permatil or peat, it's creating pore space in the soil. It's creating tiny little air pockets that hold humidity and uh, maintain, uh, maintain air. And so all of that in a sense is the same. There are certainly huge differences from product to product, but at the very base level, yes, they can be mixed just the same 
because the real goal is to create pore space in the soil, perfect, ultimate, super duper drainage. That's key for any crevice garden. Nutritionally, uh, the, the, the conversation can continue, but yeah. Um, and Deborah's asked, oh. Okay, Deborah's asking, can you create a crevice garden on a concrete base if you have an edging barrier to help hold the water from running off? Probably not. You know, if I, if I rolled into a Walmart parking lot with a dump truck of whatever and dumped it on there, I might be able to grow some pretty good vegetables on a foot and a half of compost and topsoil on top of the concrete parking lot. But for plants that need continuity with the soil below, plants that want to take advantage of all of the root run that they can get, simply putting something that is perfectly drained on top of an impervious sur surface, there will be some, some compromise and some sacrifices there. Some plants would be fine with it, but for a full palette of alpine plants, I think that whether or not you retain the water at the base, you'll still have a very wet area. It won't be necessarily the concrete that stops the water from going, uh, that stops the roots from growing. It'll probably be the water that's retained right at the level of concrete, uh, you know, that will actually truncate the roots. And so best case scenario, grab yourself a skid steer, peel up that concrete, break it up a little bit, set it on edge. <laughs> Two birds with one stone. Yes. Well, Jimmy, I was just going to mention, right. I can attest uh, to the fact that concrete does in fact work for crevice gardens. Uh, and actually I just, uh, in April of this year, I built one in right near Duke Gardens uh, out of concrete. It was uh, a home that was demolished uh, in an old part of Durham, Chapel Hill. Uh, and, uh, the, the homeowners wanted to preserve the spirit of, of the home that was there before. And so in order to do so, we reused as many materials from the demolished home as we could, the bricks, the concrete, um, anything we could get. And so now they have a beautiful crevice garden made of concrete um, in front of their house. And everybody, they just, they just uh, wrote me the other day that it seems like everybody is, is uh, slowing down, taking pictures. Uh, they're seeing a crevice garden for the very first time and they like what they see. So concrete, as broken as it might be, is, is ideal really for a crevice garden. Yes? Well, that's a very good question. Is, was compaction from the backhoe an issue uh, with the crevice garden? It was not because we had about a foot and a half of perlite and peat, which really doesn't compact uh, down on the ground already. Uh, and the crevice garden was not, except with a few tiny exceptions, it was not built. Uh, the footprint of the crevice garden was not where the backhoe was driving. Um, so really it was built. Um, now the backhoe had come in before and dropped off the perlite, dropped off the peat, and those sorts of things. But no, there was still drainage, good drainage, uh, beneath the crevice garden itself, not just the crevice garden, but the uh, sub subsurface still drains very well in that spot. Uh, no, it was not tilled. Uh, another thing that that spot actually had going for it, which not every spot would have in the same situation, there, and you saw it early in the presentation, there were mature trees cut down. And so in their dying breath, their root structure inch and a half, two inch, maybe four inch roots are still maintaining the structure of the subsoil as they get run over. And so uh, often when a tree gets cut down in a garden, there's a few years of real prosperity in that spot because the plants are able to take advantage of a soil structure that those trees created. And I think in this case, the same goes for defense against compaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, permatil certainly is your base. Uh, it depends a lot. And, and the question was, what, what would the Raleigh area preferred crevice garden mix be? Permatil, number one. Uh, at juniper level botanic gardens, some of the crevices have an 80 plus percent permatil 
uh, base in it, while other parts of the crevice garden have a 50% permatill uh, content. Uh, I believe in Cindy's garden, we were up around 80% permatill for a lot of it with compost and maybe some soil in there, a little tiny bit of soil, very small amount. It's most that soil that yeah. just washes out. So <laughs> but it does it get, out. you're right, a lot of the soil kind of settles out and it looks like you've mulched with permatill even if you haven't. But because it was originally mixed with uh, uh, compost, a little bit of soil, those nutrients remain. One of the great things about permatill is it has a cation exchange capacity comparable with compost, which means any nutrients that are there, it wants to hold on to them and then exchange them for some uh, for something uh, with with the plant root. And so, unlike gravel, as as you know, the the washed stone or even perlite, those sorts of things, as it ages, nutrients are able to flush out of that situation uh, more quickly than they can flush out of permatil, which is advantageous for plants that happen to like nutrients. Um, so around here, because it's available, permatil is a base. If you go 80 plus percent permatil, you're going to reduce the number of kinds of plants that you can grow, but allow yourself to grow plants that you can't grow in a nutrient-rich soil. Um, however, at 50% permatil, 25% organic matter, 25% native soil, we can still grow a couple thousand different kinds of plants in those ultra good draining uh, crevices. That's really the key. There's always a seam for roots to go and there's always the ability for that soil to shed that water uh, because of the stone. And so a 50-50 mix of permatil or 80% mix of permatil, that is more up to the gardener than anything. But uh, did I mention permatil? I think that, okay. Gotcha. Yes, Blake? Uh, do you worry about leaching from concrete when it's a major part of the crevice garden, i.e. raising the pH too much? I get that question most times that I've mentioned using concrete in a crevice garden. Um, not that I've seen, uh, you know, since 2016, when the crevice gardens went in at Plant Delights at Juniper level, we haven't seen any major issues with too much lime. And I mean, I, I, I tell people concrete is like weaponized limestone. It's, it, it wants to hurt you. It's an angry substance. But yeah, it absolutely will leach lime. However, most of these plants are not from the 4.5 pH uh, of the southeast. They're from alkaline situations in many cases. Uh, but it also goes to show that even plants that are from, uh, from acidic situations are more than happy to grow in a higher pH. Um, I personally feel that the pH argument is in some cases, with exceptions of course, overblown. Um, that it is, that calcium is, and, and the calcium is, it should be on every that should be the fourth character in every NPK um, discussion. It should be NPK and C, CA, something like that. Um, but, you know, there's a plant native to JLBG, actually native to the property. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's in the P family. I can't remember the, I think it's a Tephrosia. And it grew, it grows in a pH of 3.1. That is, that is the soil that it is native to. We moved it into the crevice garden in a pH of between eight and nine. And happy as can be. Blooms, seeds everywhere for better or worse. Um, but that's one happy plant. And we haven't noticed that plants were having trouble uh, so far in this situation. So yes, it leaches and that's okay. Yes, Blake. Um, how useful is coarse sand in a crevice garden mix, particularly in colder, wet climates? I, I haven't. Um, I know that um, many crevice gardens uh, do use it. Uh, I think, uh, you know, when, when Kenton and Paul in their book talk about uh, crevice garden mixes, I, I'm sure that they, uh, I think they cover that pretty well. Um, in my own mixes uh, in, at the Bristol Briar, uh, kind of a semi-crevice garden, a lot of boulder garden uh, space, 
I like to mix in Chapel Hill grit. So I like at least 50% permatil, compost, a little tiny bit of topsoil, less than 5%, less than 5%, and Chapel Hill grit. I like that stuff. It's decomposed granite. So blindly and just assuming subjectively, I feel that there's a tremendous nutrient base there in addition to being the same texture as a coarse sand. So coarse sand, sure, absolutely. Anybody else? Thank you.